How's it going, Internet? I'm Tim Stedman, and this is Get Psyched with Tim Stedman, the only show on the Internet where we argue psychological theory even more than you argue with your teacher when they ask you to do, well, just about anything. Today, we're taking a look at our fourth and final science practice, Science Practice 4, which is going to be on argumentation. So the AP Psych exam is going to have two sections. For the first section, you're going to have 90 minutes to answer 75 multiple choice questions. Now you're really going to have to utilize the first three science practices if you plan on doing well on this section. And after you complete the multiple choice section, you will then have 70 minutes to answer two free response questions. Science Practice 4 on argumentation is going to prepare you to answer these free response questions like a pro. So after watching this video, you will pretty much be an expert on how to properly form an argument in AP Psychology. And this won't only help you with getting a good score on your AP Psych exam, but it will also give you an edge on all those petty arguments you have with your friends and family. And as I mentioned earlier, you are going to have 70 minutes to complete the two FRQs, which are going to be the article analysis question and the evidence-based question. The free response section is where Science Practice 4 really comes into play. In these questions, you'll be asked to propose a defensible claim, provide reasoning grounded in science-backed evidence, and support, refute, or modify an established or provided claim. So how about we break this down a bit further? When it says we need to propose a defensible claim, it just means that we need to make a clear and concise statement that takes a position on the given topic. Your claim should be something you can defend with evidence and reasoning provided by the psychological theories and concepts that you're going to learn throughout the course. Providing reasoning grounded in evidence refers to using scientifically derived evidence to back up your claim. This could include things like research findings, data from psychological studies, or established psychological theories. It is going to be very important that your evidence is relevant and robust, directly supporting your argument. To support, refute, or modify refers to the fact that you may be asked to support an existing claim, argue against it, or suggest a modification based on the evidence you present. This is going to require critical thinking and the ability to apply psychological principles to different scenarios. Now, Let's take a closer look at each of these free response questions you will have to complete on the AP Psych test. We'll start out with the article analysis question, or AAQ, which will give you a summarized peer review source. You'll then need to identify key research elements like methodology, variables, and ethical guidelines, as well as interpret some basic statistics presented in the article. Additionally, you'll need to explain whether the study can be generalized and how the article supports or refutes the psychological concept being explored. You're going to have a total of 25 minutes to complete this question, which will include a 10 minute reading period. This question is really going to assess your skills in science practices two, three, and four. The evidence-based question, or EBQ, is next. And this is going to provide you with three summarized peer-reviewed sources on a common topic. You'll then need to propose a claim about the topic and use evidence from the sources, as well as what you've learned in AP Psychology to support your claim. You'll also need to provide reasoning to back up your evidence. For this section, you'll have 45 minutes to complete the question, including a 15 minute reading period. This question is going to assess your skills in science practices one and four. And now that we have a good understanding of the types of free response questions you'll encounter, let's talk about the task verbs used in these questions. As you're gonna see, these task verbs are just how the FRQ questions will be formatted. Being familiar with these verbs will make it much easier to score well on the free response section. The College Board uses specific task verbs to tell you exactly what they want in your answers. So here's a rundown of what each verb means and what is going to be expected from you. If the question starts with describe, be prepared to provide the relevant characteristics of a specified topic. For example, you might describe the features of a particular psychological theory or the key element of a research study. For a question asking you to explain something, be sure to provide information about how or why a relationship, process, pattern, position, situation, or outcome occurs using evidence and or reasoning to support or qualify a claim. When asked to explain how, you typically need to analyze the relationship or process. When asked to explain why, you need to analyze the motivations or reasons behind it. Identify or state questions want you to indicate or provide information about a specified topic without elaboration or explanation. This might involve simply naming a concept 
or noting a key point from a study. If a question asks you to propose, it's not talking about getting married. <laughs> All right, anyways. But it is asking you to provide a claim for a specific topic using your own words. This is your chance to put forward your own argument or hypothesis about a given topic. To support or refute means to provide reasoning that explains whether a claim or evidence should be upheld or rejected. Use your knowledge of psychological principles and evidence to back up your stance. And finally, if you're asked to use evidence, be sure to provide information from a study, such as data, rationales, conclusions, or hypotheses that is specific and relevant to a given topic. This means citing specific studies and explaining how their findings relate to your argument. All right, and now that you know what each task verb means and what's expected, Remember that these free response questions are a big chunk of your final score. Practicing them is crucial if you want to do well on the AP Psych exam. And hey, guess what? The Get Psyched to Score 5 review guide just so happens to have practice AAQs and EBQs at the end of each unit. You can find the link to download the review guide in the video description below. And while you're down there, why not subscribe to the channel? You can further inflate my ego and also make sure that you don't miss any future videos all at the same time. Practicing these questions will not only help you get a better score, but also make you more comfortable with the format and the types of questions you'll face on the exam. So make sure to take advantage of all the practice materials available to you. All right, I think it's just about time that we put all of this info into practice with an example free response question. I'm gonna walk you through how to dissect the question, identify what it's asking, and construct a strong evidence-based response. So for our example, it is going to be a bit basic, including only what we have learned from the previous science practices. With that being said, keep in mind that the AP Psych test is a cumulative exam, meaning that every unit you learn, including the science practices, are all fair game. If you take a look at the picture on the screen, you can see a breakdown of the percentage of test questions from each unit that will be on the AP Psych exam. You can find a link to the picture in the video description. It is a good document to keep in your AP Psych binder, and I've never been one to toot my own horn, but you can also just use the Get Psyched to Score 5 review guide, which also has this information. All right, now let's take a look into a sample article analysis question. Remember, the goal here is to practice how to answer the questions, not necessarily the content itself. Plus, if you're following an order, there really isn't too much content for you to know at this point. So let's take a look at our hypothetical study, which is going to be on the effects of playing video games on problem solving skills in teenagers. So here's a quick summary of our hypothetical study. Researchers at Get Psych University investigated whether daily video game training could improve problem solving skills in teenagers. They conducted a double blind controlled experiment with 200 participants aged 13 to 17 randomly assigned to either a video game group or a control group. The study found that the video game training group had significantly higher problem solving scores than the control group. The researchers concluded that daily video game training may help enhance problem solving abilities in teenagers. All right, so now using the source we have, we are going to have to answer a few questions. Now remember, all these questions are going to start with one of the task verbs we talked about earlier. So up first, we are going to have to identify the research method used in the study. And since the question is asking us to simply identify, all we need to do is say what the method is without any elaboration. A few things from our source give away the method for us. For starters, in the research method sections, it specifically states that this is a controlled experiment. Now remember, it won't always be as easy as this, and there are a few other giveaways, such as using control and experimental groups, as well as it being a double-blind study. But for us to score a point here, all we have to do is simply write down experiment. All right, part B, we are asked to state the operational definition of problem solving skills. So state is the same as identify in terms of not needing to elaborate your response. Just provide the answer and move on. Now, the operational definition is just how we specifically measure or define a variable in a study to ensure it can be empirically tested. In our experiment, this would be defined as the performance on a series of puzzles and logic tasks. This is operationally defined because it translates the abstract concept of problem solving skills into a measurable form that can be quantitatively assessed, being the test scores. All right, moving on to part C, which is going to ask us to describe the meaning of the differences in the means for the problem solving tasks between the video game training group and the control group. Now this question is asking us to describe something, which means that we have to go into a little more detail than we did with our previous two questions. As shown in the source, the mean score for the video game training group was 85, while the mean score for the control group was 70. 
This tells us that participants who engaged in daily video game training performed better on problem solving tasks compared to those in the control group. Next up we have part D, which asks us to identify at least one ethical guideline applied by the researchers. And since we're back to an identify question, we simply just have to give them an ethical standard the researchers followed, and based on our source, we see that the researchers both obtained informed consent and also ensured confidentiality of participant data, either of which would work. Part E is going to involve a bit more thinking, asking us to explain the extent to which the research findings may or may not be generalizable using specific and relevant evidence from the study. For research to be generalizable, it means that the findings can be applied to a larger population beyond the sample used in the study. In our study, we see that the sample included teenagers aged 13 to 17, which means that findings might only be applicable to this specific age group and may not generalize to younger children or adults. Additionally, the specific type of video game used may not represent all types of video games, which limits the generalizability of the results to other genres. And finally, we have part F, which is asking us to explain how at least one of the research findings supports or refutes the researcher's hypothesis that playing strategic video games enhances problem-solving skills. Here, you have to look at all the information and data the source provides you with and use that information to accept or reject a psychological claim. Using the information from our source, we could say something along the lines of the researchers' findings that the video game training group had a significantly higher mean score on problem-solving tasks supports the researcher's hypothesis that playing strategic video games enhances problem-solving skills. All right, so there you have it, an AAQ. Pretty easy, huh? But like I said, this is a simplified version of the AAQ you will see on the AP Psych test, so don't get too cocky just yet. Now with that out of the way, let's see if we can quickly get through talking about the evidence-based question. As I mentioned at the start of the video, the EBQ provides you with a common topic and three psychological studies, you're then gonna have to come up with a claim and support it using information from the sources and content you learn throughout the course. So let's get started with the EBQ. We're sticking with the same topic of playing video games and problem solving skills. So we're just going to toss in two more hypothetical research studies on the topic for our EBQ walkthrough. So the question is going to have three parts, part A, part B, and part C. And you are going to have to use the three provided sources as well as your knowledge of psychology to answer each part. So source A is just going to be the same source we used for our AAQ on the effects of video games training on problem solving skills of teenagers. Source B is going to be a study investigating the impact of cooperative versus competitive video games on team based problem solving skills in teenagers. And source C is a longitudinal study examining the long term effects of regular video game play on cognitive flexibility and problem solving skills in teenagers. Now, using these sources, we are asked to develop and justify an argument about the impact of video games on cognitive skill development in teenagers. Part A asks us to propose a specific and defensible claim based in psychological science that responds to the question. Here, you can either go with video games positively impact cognitive skills in teenagers, or it negatively does. And since I'm a bit of a gamer and consider myself to be a cognitively advanced individual, I'm going to go with the claim that engaging in various types of video games positively impacts cognitive skill development in teenagers. All right, so we have our claim. Now let's move on to part B, where we have to use evidence from one of our sources to support our claim. And a quick sidebar, for our EBQ, it is very important that whenever you reference a specific source, you properly cite the source in your response. You can do this by simply adding source A, B, or C in parentheses at the end of your sentence, or you could start the sentence with something like, according to source A, B, or C. So we could say something along the lines of, according to source A, teenagers who engaged in daily video game training showed significant improvement in problem solving skills with the video game group scoring higher than the control group. Now we move on to the second part of part B, which is going to ask us to explain how evidence from the first part of part B supports our claim by using psychological perspectives, theories, concepts, or research findings that we've learned throughout the course. And obviously, we haven't learned much yet, so I'm going to throw in some basic psychological concepts that are fairly easy to understand. We could say something along the lines of, the evidence supports the claim as it demonstrates that video game training can enhance cognitive skills such as problem solving. From a cognitive development perspective, 
This finding aligns with the theory of neuroplasticity, which suggests that engaging in mentally stimulating activities like strategic video games can strengthen neural connections and improve cognitive functions. Now, neuroplasticity is a fun little biological concept that we're gonna talk about in our first unit. Believe it or not, I've actually been practicing my juggling a bit just for when that video comes out. It's gonna be pretty dope. All right, so we used one of our sources and a psychological concept to support our claim. And now for part C, we get to do it all over again. Part C asks us to do the same thing as part B, but we have to use a different source and different psychological concept in supporting our claim. For part C, we could say something along the lines of, source B indicates that cooperative video games improved team-based problem-solving skills more effectively than competitive games, highlighting the social and cognitive benefits of certain types of games. This evidence supports the claim by showing that cooperative gaming can foster social interactions and collaborative problem solving, which are critical components of cognitive development. According to Lev Vygotsky's social development theory, social interactions play a fundamental role in the development of cognition and cooperative games provide an excellent platform for such interactions. And there you have it. By breaking down the question, proposing a clear claim, using evidence from the provided sources, and backing up your evidence with reasoning from different psychological perspectives and theories, you can effectively answer an AP Psychology FRQ. Remember, practicing these questions will not only help you get a better score, but also make you more comfortable with the format and the types of questions you'll face on the exam. So, for like the hundredth time, please do make sure that you are taking advantage of all the practice materials available to you. All right. And this brings an end to our review on the AP Psychology Science Practices. Remember, you are expected to utilize these practices through each unit of the course. But luckily for you, or maybe unluckily, depending on how you look at it, I guess, these videos aren't going anywhere. So you are always welcome to come back for a rewatch. And I will see you all next time as we get started with Unit 1 of 5 in AP Psychology, The Biological Basis. Until then... Peace.